everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Celtic View podcast. The first episode back in our studio for 2023. It's felt like quite a, a long time since we've been in here. I'm Ryan Marr and I'm back joined by Paul Cuddy, Celtic View editor. Paul, how are you? And it's, yeah, it has felt like quite a while since we've been in here. It is good to be back and you know I know people who have been listening and watching have been speculating that you stopped this part of the podcast because of your dire performance in the predictions, but I know that's not the case. It's not the case, and we will get into that later on, so you'll have your chance to gloat later. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll leave you waiting for that for a, for a little while longer. But, but yeah, since it is the first one back, uh, for us in the studio anyway, of 2023, I think the last time we were together was just before Christmas time, so I thought today might be a good chance to kind of look back on all three teams since we were last in the studio, but we also have a special guest on today's podcast as well is former Celtic player Stefan Johansson sat down with us for a, an exclusive chat for a good 30 minutes or so going back through his old Celtic career and his goals and memories so definitely stick around for that because it's a, it's a really really good listen but Paul why don't we start off um, with the first team uh, we're sitting here after a 4-1 win away to St Johnston at the weekend but since the winter break we'll take this from it's been 12 games 11 wins, 1 draw, 35 goals scored. How good have the Celtic been since, since returning back from the break? I mean, it's been, it's been really impressive. I mean, an almost perfect uh, record. And it's, it's not just the fact that, that we're winning. I think it's just the fact that the, the football we're playing. I think people are really enjoying coming to the games. They're really enjoying the way we're playing. Um, I think what's always encouraging whenever you... You know, you listen to the manager talking, you've interviewed him obviously after quite a few of the games, that there's no rest in the laurels, that actually the, there's real high demands to, to not only maintain the standards but to improve them. And I think the combination of what they're doing every day is what we see. But I think every day behind the scenes, you know, I think that the standards that have been set by, obviously demanded by the manager, set by the likes of Cal McGregor, Joe Hart, Greg Taylor, the senior players, but everybody's buying into it and the new players have brought in as well, you know, have hit the ground running too, you know, particularly, you know, likes of Alistair Johnson has just fitted in seamlessly. It looks as if he's been playing for the club for, for years. So, yeah, it's, it's really positive and really enjoyable. I think that's, a, that's the main thing, you know, over the years we've all been lucky enough to see Celtic teams winning and that's fantastic. But, you know, this is, I think, for, you know, it's as good as the football that we're seeing is as good as, as anything we've seen in recent years. And taking it from returning from the winter break, I think even if you look back to last season and all the chat during the summer was we're, we're going to improve, the manager was saying that we'll just keep looking to get better. And you're like, how can this team get better? We got better at the start of this season and since the winter break we got better again. The ceiling for this team is just so high. Yeah, and I think but that, that, that comes obviously from what the manager demands and then obviously the players have bought into that. And as players, they, they want to improve. And, uh, you know, I don't think there is for any, any team. There's a, there's a limit. The, only, the limit, I suppose, is what they set themselves. And if, if you're constantly, you know, the, the stats that you're reading out are really impressive. But if they're saying, well, you know, that's fine, that's in the past, right? But what are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? Then we, we as fans, get the benefit of that because we see, you know, the, the culmination of everything they're doing. But it... I think it's really important, and it was a really interesting thing. The manager had said, I think he was asked about, I think the, I don't know if it was a dynamic at Lennox Town, and he'd said, I know he said to us before, he he never goes into the the dressing room at, at Lennox Town. That's the players' domain, and that's where he uh, relies on the captain and the senior players to set those standards. And and it's obvious that that's the case. And you know, if if anybody's ever lucky enough to see a Celtic training session, it's it's people like Callum McGregor that are, you know, they're leading the way, they're training the way they play, and everybody else is, is buying into that. And, you know, I, I, I say I think that the sky is the limit, you know. Obviously, there's still a lot of football to be played this season, and we hope for, you know, even more success than last season. But, you know, you go into every game now and think you're going to win, but you know you're going to see some really good football as well. Yeah, I mean, within those 12 games since coming back from the winter break, I think the first game against Aberdeen was was really important getting a victory late on just to kind of kick starters again coming back but we've you know we've reached a, a cup final we're into the next round the last 16 of the cup which is this weekend against St Mirren 
our league form as well has just been sensational away from home, at home, it doesn't matter at all. What has impressed you the most about those 12 games so far? I, th I think it's the overall, obviously the, the way we play and we're, we're used to watching the way we play now, but I, I love the way that, you know, it doesn't matter who the manager plays, it's like a, a seamless, whoever starts or whoever comes on, they, they fit into that system, but they're all meant to, and they're all expected to make an impact. And, you know, that, that's what's really impressive as an overall squad. I think the, the performances of the players who were at the World Cup, in particular Alan Moy and Dyson Maida, since they've come back, have been, have been phenomenal. Um, and I'm not just saying that as a, as a, as a fellow <laughs> ball, ball person. Um, they've been exceptional. And again, it's interesting. I think Alan Moy, I suppose the manager know, knew both of those players really well, having worked with them. And obviously... Adam Moy came in. He hadn't played a lot of football, so it took him a bit of time to get up to speed. Once he did, he was he was playing his part. Went to the World Cup, was absolutely outstanding for Australia, and has come back and has just gone to a different level. And I feel slightly sorry for him because it means that he keeps getting hauled out for these post-match interviews, which he doesn't obviously, it. well, I think that's an understatement. <laughs> um, I think they've been excellent, as I say. I think, you know, particularly I think Alistair Johnson's really impressed me since he came in. You know, I. I a real tough debut away at Ibrox, and um, you know he, he looks good on the ball, but he looks as if he's he's uh, he's up for the fight. If he want, if you know, people aren't going to mess with him. You know, he, off the park, he's just a really nice guy and really really pleasant. But I think when he gets on that park, he's he's there to win. And I think again that feeds into the the manager's philosophy. But um, no, it's there's no negatives. I mean, that's the thing. You could just pick pluck any player out. Kyogo's form, Hatati, you know, you know, Jota's just hitting this rich vein of form as well. The defence is, you know, so solid now. Uh, you know, everything's it's all good. Yeah, and I was going to say you were talking about the players in the team, Maeda and Moy, and sticking up for them because they're both. I was going to stick up for the guys with there, like Hatati and <laughs> Kyogo. Um, but as you said, it's just been there have been so many positives because my next question was going to be, who, what player has impressed you the most? But it's, it is actually so hard to pinpoint one because you start talking about one and Aaron Moy, who has been sensational. He was amazing against St. Johnson at the weekend. That, that goal was just... I was sitting in the stands and that way you start laughing when a goal goes in because it was so good. But then you start saying him and then you start talking about Kyogo and the goals he scored and you're like, oh, what about Hitati? And then what about... Kar it's every player on the team has just been on absolutely... On, top of their game which is it's amazing to see but it must be such an amazing position for the manager as well absolutely yeah because and, and again I remember I think when at some point earlier in the season when everybody was getting back to full fitness and it was that cliched question does that give you a headache and he said no the headache is when you don't have enough players to choose from <laughs> that actually it's a good thing and I, again I think you know it's the culminations the, the game is the culmination of everything they do every day and, but it's, it's what they're doing behind the scenes which is is, is making it so good that they're obviously the standards are so high they're pushing themselves the way they're, they're training and I think it's interesting the way that we utilise the squad because of the intensity that we play at and then you can you're bringing maybe three I think I sometimes feel sorry for the opposition when, when you see you know just for argument's sake you'll see um, you know David Turnbull Matt O'Reilly and Leila Bada lining up to come on and you're thinking I mean, they could easily start. There's no, you know, all it does is continue what what the start the eleven had, and it's it's such a good position to be in. But I get, I think probably for me, because as fans, I think you can get carried away a wee bit, and that's that's only right. But I think what's really good is that you know this team under this manager don't do that. That you know Sunday was a really good victory um, and a really tough pitch. But yeah, they'll just all they'll focus on is this Saturday against St Mirren. They won't look too far ahead, so they'll not start to think, "Oh, we've, you know, we've won eleven out of the last twelve games, and you know, we're really brilliant." I think that, that, that's as far away from their thinking as possible. And and he's got a, a set of players that are really they're so focused, and that, that's the biggest thing because, you know, we're in such a strong position. But you know, everybody knows in football that that can change if people take their eye off the ball, and, and that this team aren't going to do that. Yeah, definitely, and. I mean, strikers a lot of the time always get the headlines and Kyogo since coming back from the winter break as well. You mentioned Maeda, um, who's been exceptional, but Kyogo's 
return in terms of goals. I think it's 11 goals I've got here in 12 games, which is sensational. But that actually adds into the next point I wanted to bring up, which was which is the defensive performances of Celtic. There's been eight clean sheets in there. And so much of that is what the defence do in that back line. But so much of it as well is what Kyogo and the rest of the attackers do in that attacking line as well to start the defence. But bringing it all together as a defensive unit, we've been so solid as well, haven't we? Yeah, and I think whether you speak to the defenders or the goalkeeper or the coaching staff, they make that point. And I think you saw it even at the weekend. There was a couple of Kyogo incidents where the ball gets played back to the goalkeeper and he just races in to close him down and the goalkeeper ends up kicking out of play because the, they know they can't afford to hesitate because he's right on them. And there was another one, I think we were winning three or four one at the time. And again, I think the left back was going to clear it and Kyogo races over, slides in and blocks it. And again, that just stops the, the team getting up the park. And as you say, we, was it six games or six or seven games in a row, we had mm -hmm. clean sheets. You know, we lost our first goal at the weekend, which I think is people watching will, will, will know better than me whether that was the, the first goal in a few Celtic games that actually wasn't checked for VAR for some reason. <laughs> I can't think why, but um, but yeah, it's, the, the back four seems so solid now. Alistair Johnson, I say, is fitted in. Carter Vickers and Starfelt have this unbelievable defensive record of, I don't think they've ever lost a, no, no. a domestic game when the two of them have are partnered each other, which is extraordinary. And Greg Taylor... You know, in a, in a in a team of of really high performers, for me, I mean, he's definitely in, in the running for for player of the year. For me, I think he's been absolutely outstanding this mm -hmm. season. And at times in the game against St. Johnson on Sunday, they did put us under pressure, and we did have to defend our box, but they just all stood up to it. So it's been it's been brilliant to see. Um, another point I wanted to mention was, which we kind of touched upon, the new signings, four players coming in in January, well, I say January, the first one was actually initially signed in the end of November and Alistair Johnson was in, that was Yuki Kobayashi, Alistair Johnson was the start of December, so it feels like a long time ago since they were announced, but they've all made minutes, they've all had their first appearances in, in January. Um, what have you made of the ones that, that have played a lot and in terms of maybe like Tomoko Iwata and O as well have, have come off the bench a couple of times? Have you seen much in them and about what they can maybe do going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I think certainly with Alistair Johnson and, and Yuki Kobayashi, I think the, the benefit they had was training with the team for four or five weeks before we even started playing again. So that in terms of uh, how we want to play and the tempo we want to play at, they were right up to speed, which is why when the two of them came in, they just slotted in effortlessly. And Kobayashi, you know, can probably consider himself unlucky because, you know, he didn't put a foot wrong in the two games. But to the point we just made, that partnership of Carl Starfelt and, and Cameron Carter Vickers is just exceptional. So, you know, it's difficult to, you know, usurp either of them. I think the other two players, it's just, you know, slowly but surely, you know, the more they're training and the, the more the manager just introduces them into the, the team. He obviously, in, in, again, he knows them and he knows what they're like. Um, oh, we've seen wee glimpses of him. And he's obviously desperate to get his, his first goal. He was really unlucky when he spun yeah. Considine at the weekend and was brought down. Because at least he'd, he'd have got the shot off. But again, he's only had a handful of, of training session, uh, training sessions. Uh, Awata is quite, it's quite an interesting one because obviously he came to Celtic on the back of a really impressive season in Japan. And when he's come on, he's come on for Callum McGregor. Um, so again, it gives the manager, there was a game, I think maybe in the Morton game, with the, the yeah, option of yeah. taking the captain off and bringing someone in who could just anchor that midfield and again he looked really confident uh, on the ball so I think you know all these players aren't going to immediately come straight into the team but then they become part of that squad and when they come on they're expected to make an impact. Yeah the funny thing about O in the games so far when he's come off the bench is you can tell the Celtic fans don't really know what song to, to sing yet it's like we're going through quite a few different options and there's just because there, there's so many possibilities with his name so I'm actually looking forward to the fans sticking to one song that we can all get behind because there's so many different ones going back and forth at the moment. But uh, yeah, as soon as he starts scoring goals, I think uh, he's a, with a name like that, we're going to be hearing plenty of him as Absolutely. well. Um, and then that leads us now into the next sort of, it's not really half a season, but the next third of the season. Um, we've got St Mirren 
at home in the cup, uh, then got a league tie before the league cup final to close out February as well. So this is obviously that stage of the season where the awards are handed out. Um, but it's a really exciting part of the season for Celtic because we have been performing so well and we keep getting stronger. And if we continue to do that, then fingers crossed and touch wood, we're going to have a lot to celebrate. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose every game and every month is important, but certainly this month with the, the first trophy up for grabs at the end of the month. And as I say, as fans, we can look ahead to that as we do. But I know that the players will only be focusing on the, the St Mirren game and then obviously we'll have a game against Aberdeen at home as well. So before they start to think about the cup games. And, and again, the manager touched on it, the fact that we haven't had too many midweek games is beneficial because it allows uh, them to spend a lot of time on the training pitch, working on various things with the squad. And I think that, that's a real benefit as well. Yeah, definitely. Now, let's give you an interview with, with Stefan Johansson and after that we'll look at the B team and the women's team. So, Stefan Johansson won a couple of league titles at Celtic, won Player of the Year in 2015, scored plenty of goals as well and he sat down with us to look back on his time as a Celtic player. Hi everyone and what a guest we have on this week's edition on the Celtic Review podcast. It's the former Celtic Player of the Year, former PFA, Scotland Player of the Year and a former Norwegian midfielder, Stefan Johansson. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Yeah, all good. Thank you. Good to be here. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to going back to some of these memories that you had at Celtic because... You had so many good moments in the time that you were at the football club. I suppose to begin with, Stefan, interested to know about how the move to Celtic Hall came about. So if you just kind of take us back to that January period in 2014, I think it was, where you signed for the club, how did it all materialise? Yeah, no, obviously because um, the season finished back home in Norway in about November time. So it was more like, a, uh, you know, and we went. I think we went on a, a a training camp with the national team actually in Abu Dhabi, and uh, had a few chats with my agent over the period in December. And you know, um, Celtic came, got mentioned, and me, me and my wife had a, had a little chat. And then uh, there was only one really option then, and then everything went quite quick. And I, f I knew Celtic was a big club, but then I flew out to Glasgow, and then you realize how big a club it was because I didn't expect like all the you know cameras and the, the you know yeah the private entrance for the medical and stuff like that. So it was, so it was a bit shocking, but it was it was uh, it was brilliant. Yeah, because from where you come from before you're at Strom Godset, where you'd won the league title, Bodo Glimp before that, and. I was fortunate enough to go over to Bodo um, in, in February last year and, and see what that was like. So to go from those venues to then 60,000 at Celtic Park and, and this club, what was that transition like for you? No, it was, it was a big shock, to be honest. And you watch, like, obviously the Champions League games and stuff. So it's, it was, um, you, you kind of knew it, but then it's, it's a completely different experience when, you, when, when you're there in, in person. So... Um, no, it was quite a shock, but it was a uh, it was a brilliant time, you know. I, I the the fans, um, what do you say, the city, the players, everyone was so welcoming. So it was uh, it was quite easy to to get into the group and uh, yeah, to feel feel home quite quickly. Brilliant. I'm always interested to know when players sign for a new club what it's like in those initial days. So. When you joined in that January, talk us through what it was like coming into the club in terms of being with your teammates. I don't know if you had to do any initiations or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's quite the same everywhere you go, to be honest. It's uh, obviously, obviously like you need... I didn't know many many of them before, but obviously Mickey was Swedish, so I kind of, you know, I knew he has been in Rosenborg and, and stuff, but... Um, it's quite, you know, you get stuck in a hotel because obviously you don't know have a flat or anything, and then uh, it's literally training and go back to the hotel. So, um, but when when I came, every I said everyone was quite friendly, and 
and then yeah first first home game i think was the first away game we got to sing a song so i chose the norwegian national anthem so no one could understand what i was saying <laughs> <laughs> oh I, was everyone just kind of looking at you when you were standing up there singing just completely bemused at what you were singing <laughs> Yeah, it's not nice. It's not gonna. I, I don't. I don't. I don't like it. But it's one thing you gotta do for 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 a, a banter. So uh, that, that's all right. Like everyone's gotta go through it at one stage of their career. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you about uh, Virgil Van Dyke later on, but since you mentioned him there, you two seem to have quite a close connection. But when you first came into the club, we all see the the success that he's had. Probably one of the world's best defenders. Did, could you tell from that first moment that you saw him that he would go on to be the player that he is just now? Yeah, I, I think everyone could see it because I think, um, yeah, as a player he was um, he was unbelievable. Like even even back then, you know, obviously um, he's progressed a lot since then as well. But you could see he was he was a top player already then, and it's just a matter of time for him to to move in to it to be one of the best in the world, I think. And he, he may, you know, he's worked hard for it, but um, the talent and everything has been there. So I think everyone can agree that they saw that quite early with him. Brilliant. So you've, you've joined the club, you're starting to settle in on the park, settling in off the park in terms of life in Glasgow. What was what were those kind of opening few months for you? I'm sure you got to have a chance to try all of our local delicacies and our food and, and love our Glasgow weather. So how did you find that time? No, because I'm, as you said, you've been in Boulder before, so the weather wasn't quite a shock. It, it was actually a, a little bit better than what I'm used to. So, um, but no, to be fair, as I said earlier, like people were so friendly and, you know, it's, it's kind of a new thing that being, you know, you could understand how big Celtic is in Glasgow and, in general in Scotland because everywhere you go like people would say hello and like everyone's friendly um so it was quite a shock um it's kind of a new lifestyle really because I wasn't used to it but um as I said my uh, my uh, my wife came over and you know as soon as we started to get friends obviously with Mick yeah, with Nir um uh, and and uh, Virgil and then we we you know we had a little group there and which we went out to eat together and stuff. So we were quite quickly getting friends and felt very uh, welcome by uh, by everyone in the club and also the, uh, our friends. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've been in the, the UK now for, for such a long time that you're probably used to all of the accents, but when you first came in, could you understand all of the, the Glaswegian accents and everyone when they were chatting to one another? <laughs> To be fair, the, I think they took it quite slowly on me, to be honest, because, uh, yeah, there was a few times it was, uh, I probably looked like a question mark when I was sitting there and, and they were trying to speak. But um, I remember when uh, Bruni and James Forrest and them were speaking to each other, I, I, I struggled a little bit, yeah, because that was, the, it went too quick for my ear. So, uh, but I think they took it easy on me, so that was all right. <laughs> In terms of the football then in that the first season for yourself, obviously you signed in the January, we went on to, to win the title again uh, in Neil Lennon's last year as manager. You really hit the ground running. I think your first start was a win against St Mirren and you got man of the match. You started to score some goals as well. Was it just a case of you at that time having come straight from the Norwegian League of carrying on your form when you came into Celtic? Yeah, obviously this that's one part of it, but also you know when you come to a new club and and you um yeah you you know in we had the the, the holiday in 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 uh, December, but you wanted to stay fit, you know. I I kind of knew there was a move around the corner, so you wanted like be as fit as possible to to get in to impress at a new club, but especially you know when you go, it's probably like. That was the first club abroad for me as well, so you, you kind of wanted to do that. But obviously, confidence had a massive part. But also, I, I think you cannot un underestimate like the way you felt welcomed by the the fans and the the, the staff and the players and stuff. Obviously, helps a lot because you know as soon as you go into the group and and you feel welcomed, like you're 
I think your performance is gonna get better and stuff. So it, it was uh, it was brilliant, like as a welcome in, in welcoming club, and I think that helped me a lot. And a perfect way to top off that season by winning the league. I think you scored in the game against Partick Thistle away, where we we clinched the title. Just tell us about the the celebrations and your memories of of that league title, because I know. You won the league title with Strom Godset and Ronnie Dyla stripped his pants. So I don't know if you were expecting Neil Lennon to do the same at Partick Thistle. <laughs> no, Lennon was good to be fair. Like he was, he was a great character and you know obviously a good manager and stuff. But uh, it's something you know when I came came to Celtic, you, you kind of felt quite quickly that winning is in like in the culture there, and that that's the you know it's a big big demand there. Um, and obviously on the day when, when you win the title, there's nothing better, you know, we, you go out and celebrate and, you know, a uh, good time with it. I obviously was there just for a half of the season, but in another way to win, win my first trophy in Scotland was quite, quite big. So, uh, it, that's a day I will never, never forget. So it was, uh, it was a brilliant time and, you know, it's, as I said, winning is just in, in, in the DNA of Celtic there. So you, you kind of had to. Yeah, learned that quite quickly. So then into the, the next season, so your first pre-season with the club, it was a, a campaign where you were in amazing form, you won all the Player of the Year titles. But that summer, obviously Neil Lennon leaves the club, Ronnie Diala comes in, your former manager. What were your feelings like when, when he was coming into the door? I imagine all the players were coming up to you and asking you lots of questions about him. Yeah, no, it, it was um, so like we went on, on a vacation that summer, and I think it was, if I'm not wrong, I think a few uh, representatives from the club and stuff phoned me and asked about him. And, um, you know, I was quite honest because I've, you know, I, we, me and Ronnie had um, quite good success back home in Norway, and I thought like he would be a, a, a very good fit for uh, Celtic. Um, and then obviously the deal got done, and People will always be curious and stuff, but I think you know. To be fair, I think they bought into what he wants to. Um, he wants to play attractive uh, football and offensive football, um, and I think the players realized that quite quickly. So um, it wasn't really much I could say. Like I think when a manager comes in, like he he speaks for himself, and he he needs to get his ideas into the players' head, and and I think he did that quite quickly. And um, yeah. We went to to win a few more titles under him. So uh, in general, I think he had a good time there. Yeah, when the talk was about Ronnie coming in to the club, did he speak to you at any point during that time to ask you questions about about Celtic? No, um, not that I remember. Maybe like uh, I, I couldn't like because obviously we we also had like a manager player relationship, even though we've been before. So um, uh, he. Also used, I think he used the same agent as me, if I'm not wrong, or I can't really remember. But obviously, that like, most of the talks go through there because there's obviously going to be like a manager players relationship. Um, but no, I, I can't remember he asked too much about it. But I think he knew already because, like, as I said, Celtic Champions League is quite big back home in Norway. So I think everyone has kind of one idea of, of what to expect and. Uh, yeah, to be a manager for that club and a player is, is a big pressure and it's, it's a privilege, you know. I think you learn a lot about yourself and, um, yeah, about winning mentality. Because obviously in that campaign, we'll go through some of the key moments in a little bit more detail, but just in general, your season was, was brilliant. I think some of the football we played were obviously extremely close to winning three titles as well. So. What is it about Ronnie Dyla, you think, maybe in that summer and the pre-season and throughout the campaign that he changed that allowed us to have such a successful campaign? I just think, you know, as I said earlier, I think his ideas of football is very modern. I think he, you know, you can see he's, he's learned a lot from a short period of, of managing, even back home in Norway, you know. I think he was, I just think he was a good good fit for yeah, club and the manager, because I think in Celtic, you have to play offensive football, you have to score goals, you have to entertain the crowd. And I think the way he, when he, as you said, that there, the preseason and stuff, when he got time to get them ideas and get to work on the training pitch with the players, 
I think that's, you know, it just comes as a result of that. And, you know, as you said, we won, we won a few titles and that's what what's demanded at Celtic. And then and, and we did that. So, uh, yeah, I think he can, he can look back at that career and, um, and be really proud. Let's go into a little bit more detail about your own kind of personal achievements in, in that season. I think 13 goals in total. You scored some big ones. I remember one away to Aberdeen at Petaudry in a, a tight 2-1 win. Uh, there's plenty of other brilliant... The goal against Johnson as well, away from home. What do you think clicked for you that season to make you so prolific in front of goal and to have such a good campaign? I think us as a team, to be honest with you, I think um, the team we had was unbelievable. Like from from back to front, it was. Um, I knew we were always always going to create chances. I knew we were always going to control games. Um, so it was kind of just having a little look and speaking with the manager how I can be more effective in in you know. There's one thing about you know, obviously creating chances, but at, at the end of the day, you need it's your your goals and assist and you want to, to contribute to the team with that. So that's what something I had to look at and, you know, try to be more effective in that role. And um, we we managed that quite well. So it's it was a, a brilliant season for me personal and, and as a team as well. So it's, uh, it's something I'll, I'll never forget. Do any moments for you stand out and just a couple that come to my mind from that campaign in terms of the team's point of view. Um, obviously, winning the, the League Cup final and, and beating Rangers in the semi-final. And then we had that game against Inter Milan as well. But from a personal point of view for yourself and then as a sort of team point of view, what kind of moments really stand out for you? To beat Rangers is definitely up there. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I knew it was big, but to, yeah realize it in person and the build up and how much it means to everyone who is is you know a lot of people when since i've been coming to england has, has asked me about them games and i said there's something you just need to to experience yourself because there's it's unbelievable and to go out and win win that game it, it was incredible so that's that's probably the highlight but as you mentioned there that's uh inter milan game at home it's the atmosphere was, I was, yeah, it's, uh, when, when I get asked about it, it's, uh, you know, gives me goosebumps because it's, it was unbelievable. So um, I would I, I put them to highlights. Obviously, you know, winning titles and stuff is what matters and, and, and things like that. But if you, if you were to choose two games, I would, I would go, uh, go with them too. Can I ask about the game against Rangers in the semi final? You were mentioning it there about, Sometimes you don't actually really realise how big these things are until you, you live in them. So for yourself, like in the lead up to a game like that, maybe the week before it, was it just a real eye opener for you? Was there anything that you kind of can remember from from those weeks? Yeah, I like if if me and the, my wife went to for a coffee or whatever it was in the city centre, like everyone was pointing out, cannot lose that game, cannot lose that game. I think it was even. I, I think it was I, I went to do some grocery shopping and um one of the I, I think the one of the guys that worked there was was a Rangers fan and he didn't want to serve me and stuff or whatever. It was like he didn't want to help out to find what, what I wanted. So I just said like, well, I this is the real deal, isn't it? So uh we were just laughing about it. You know, I, I just think as I said, you you got to be there to understand how how crazy it is and uh, and what a brilliant experience as well. Yeah, uh, it, it really was a brilliant occasion that day and the Inter Milan game as well, as, as you mentioned. I think that was maybe one of the first times in, in that kind of period for Celtic where we really kind of felt the noise again at Celtic Park on a, a big European night. Like what, take it into the mindset of a player during a, a game like that and the noise of it all when particularly when we scored that late goal from John Gadetti? No, it's, you know, it, uh, it, it's, it's kind of hard to explain the feeling about it because you like, you just, you just there in, in emotions and stuff, you know, you just, you don't think any differently before that game. You don't do that, but like when you come out there and obviously the fans, you know, you never walk alone before the game and stuff. It's just gives you goosebumps thinking about it. And um, 
the fact that like you, you yeah, ten meters from each other, you can't hear a word what you're saying and stuff. It's it's just insane. So, um, and also the comeback, obviously there, it was, yeah, just just a crazy night. And you know, before before I signed for Celtic, everyone was speaking about these European nights and stuff. And I, obviously, I haven't, um, yeah, I haven't experienced it myself, but. Uh, that's that's something I'll never forget. That to say it uh, at least. Yeah, brilliant. Um, take us into kind of the dressing room then, and that season, and just kind of your time at Celtic, and particularly when you have those big moments and you win the titles and you get a chance to celebrate. I'm always kind of keen for a few stories if you have any, and and what those celebrations are like. Did you have a chance to kind of go out with with players, and you know, does anything to kind of come to mind from those moments? To to be fair, like there wasn't really like any massive massive celebrations, you know. It's, it's, it was more like you know, with on the on the pitch and so. I think that was the best day to be completely honest. With you, I think you know the the trophy day where you get to celebrate with the fans and you know, and um, every like all the family comes together. I had it might might sound boring, but I honestly think that was like the best days and and um, you know that's that's what I will remember, you know. To bring, just to see everyone celebrating together, and I, I think that was brilliant. Um, yeah, and just remember that Jay as well came on the pitch and, and celebrated with us. Like you know, it's it's brilliant for him to see come and, and be a part of it and stuff. So uh, no, it's absolutely uh, that might sound boring, but I don't really have any stories about it. I was wanting something of someone being steaming drunk or something, but that's fine. I can we'll take that. <laughs> um, just gonna move on to then the, the next season, Stefan, and then the following summer you, you then leave the club. So we obviously win another another league title. You have a, a massive part to play in that as well. Um but then when you when it comes to, to leaving the club and when, when Brendan Rogers comes in, I think it's kind of documented you were talking about getting a new contract and things. So was it just a case of maybe trying to have a kind of fresh start elsewhere and, and move on to Fulham? Yeah, no, it was to be fair, like Brendan came in and he was he was brilliant to me. Um we had a few good chats earlier on and I knew I'd I think I had one year left on my contract. And um he he, he said his opinion and you know I got a feeling that that he wanted me to stay and get a sign a new deal. But um by the time then I think there was, you know, Time for as you said there, time for a fresh start somewhere else. And I've been at that Celtic for three years, and I absolutely love the time. I, I you know I look back and me and my wife still speaks about it. What a great time we had there. Um, but it just I think it was just naturally came to the point where where we needed a fresh start. And you know um, the previous season at Celtic wasn't great either. But on a personal level, I. I didn't perform the way I wanted to perform and, and, and stuff like that. So sometimes you just got to be honest in that way. But Brenton was unbelievable. Um, we had a baby on the way then. Um, he, he handled that situation brilliant with me. Um, all the transfer stuff and with obviously Fulham coming in and a few other clubs. Um, the way he treated me as a, as a person and uh, like to look after the family as well was absolutely brilliant. So... Um, yeah, it was it was so uh, yeah. It's something that I have a lot of respect for uh, him as a man and as a manager. Still a real place for Celtic in your heart at this moment in time. You know, even though it's been about five or six years since you've left the club. Yeah, no, that's it's. Uh, you know, I I still follow Celtic, and you know, I try to watch as many many games as I, I possibly can, and it's it's. Um, it's definitely a heart in my a club in my heart, and was always be and it's, it's a it's a, yeah it's a special club for me. Though. Yeah, um, just a few other questions about your time after Celtic, and then we always end when we've got guests with some quick fire questions. Um, just for your time from Fulham, one player who we now have at our club, Matt O'Reilly, who you would have played a, a couple of games with as well. Just interested to know a little bit more about what Matt was like when he was coming through at Fulham and again, was he a player who you really thought could go on and kind of make that step to a club like Celtic? Yeah, he, uh, Matt, Matt was really good, you know, great, great kid coming up through, through the Fulham ranks and I think you've seen uh, in training his qualities was definitely there. 
but his work ethic as well was brilliant. You know, as I said, top top uh, guy, which worked his socks off every time he had the chance. And um, but that's probably a little bit the same as me at Celtic. I think uh, he needed a new fresh start in Fulham because he he was a little bit in and out of the first team and stuff. And then to you know to go to a club like Celtic, it's uh, you know it's it's obviously massive and. And I think he's uh, when I've watched it, I think he's done brilliant. You know, he's, he's um, and I'm not surprised because talent is there, but he's like top top guy in, in general. So uh, I'm I'm very happy for him that he's succeeding there. Yeah, he's doing brilliant at the club as well, and the fans have really taken to him. Um, another question. This is it doesn't have anything to do with Celtic, but you're the first person I've ever spoken to that has played with Erling Haaland, and from a personal point of view. I always want to know a little bit more about what he's like because he seems like an absolute machine and scoring goals constantly. Like, is he? People always say, "Is he actually human?" Like, what is he? What is he like when you when you train and play with a guy like that? Obviously, like top top player, you know, and his physical attributes is is incredible. But all, like, he's he's got the full package. His finishing, his you know, power. Everything about him like just stinks of goals, and you can see that like in, from early early stages. And I think he's developed his game. I think he's got a lot better in in you know obviously using his strength and stuff. And you know when you have players like De Bruyne and and, and the boys around you, you know you know you're gonna get chances. So um, I'm so happy for him. But uh, again, top top guy, you know. Um, Good, good guy to have in the dressing room. Definitely, um, likes a bit of banter as well. So no, I, I, you know, I can only praise him. And it was, it, it was only a matter of time before he, uh, you know, took the big stage as well. So um, he's he's there now and he's doing his thing and he's he's he's, he's a brilliant guy. Yeah, and unfortunately, Norway are playing Scotland in the next qualifier, so we have to deal with that. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, it's on fire then. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm I'm pretty scared about that. So <laughs> we we'll see how it goes. Um, Stefan, what we do to end when the time we've got a guest on is to go through some quick fire questions. So you can answer them as quick as you like. You can, if you've got a story, go for it. Um, so we'll we'll run through some of them just now. So, um, first of all, what was your favourite goal you scored for Celtic? Oh. Uh, Favorite goal? Yeah, I didn't score, but my sister Lee Griffiths against Rangers is my favorite goal attribution. So we'll we'll say that. <laughs> we'll take that. Um, one about your your teammates. A couple about your teammates. Who is the loudest player in the dressing room? Mm, loudest. I'd say either Mickey or Bruni. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, good banter on both of them, to be fair. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed listening to them, yeah. <laughs> Anything spring to mind about maybe pranks they played on anybody? Um, no, I think it was, you know, quite calm. Like, it's not really pranks. It's uh, Lenny liked a little bit of a joke. Um, but no, no, not really pranks. It was more uh, the worst, worst part by far is the singing to come to a new club and you have to stand on the chair and sing, that's that's horrific. <laughs> now, I don't know if you had a fine system at the club as players when you were there, but if you did, what player would get fined the most? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, we had the fine system. The, 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 can't really remember who got to find the most. I, just, I got a lot of fines for speaking Norwegian with Mickey because that wasn't allowed. We were only allowed to speak English and, you know, my English, I wasn't the most confident in my English. So um, I tried to yeah, speak a little bit of Norwegian with him a few times and Bruni was listening around the corner. So there, there was a few quid going there. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> do, do you ever remember Thank you so much. anyone getting fined for something really ridiculous or was there maybe anyone that was constantly late for training and getting fined for that yeah well, normally it would be just you know if i'm late for training or late for yeah team bus and stuff like that but 
Yeah, I, I, I didn't agree with that Norwegian fine, so I, I was quite uh, angry with Bruni at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your, what was the best atmosphere you played in during your time at Celtic? Maybe one of those games the Rangers were in to Milan once, I imagine? Inter at home. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice, nice easy one. Um, what player in the Celtic team would you say was the best technically that you, that you worked with? Best technically? Yeah. Oh. I think, yeah, I would probably say James Forrest on his best. No, oh, sorry. Yeah, either Jamesy or, or uh, Samaras. Yeah. Samaras was a joke. He was uh, unbelievable. Yeah, when he when he turned it on, he he could yeah. definitely go, couldn't he? And with James as well, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Still at the club and still firing. It's just what a player. Yeah, both of them unbelievable. Yeah, um, a couple more then we'll go for. Um, what is the best goal that you saw from another Celtic player? Is there anything that ever springs to mind at a goal in any of the games? You just thought, wow, I can't believe that. Mm. Yeah, I actually think I remember it because I think it was one of my first game or even my first game away uh, and Virgil was hitting a free kick, I think it was. So I didn't expect that from the centre half. Like I just, he put it top in and I was like, hold on, and he's a centre back. So I, I, yeah, I was quite surprised with that. So I'll, I'll say that, yeah. Yeah, I think that was the game away to Hibs, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm actually surprised I've not seen him hit more free kicks since he's left because he scored a lot for us. He was brilliant at them. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. So no, I was I was a bit surprised with that. <laughs> and finally, Stefan, um, what's your favourite memory from your time at Celtic, or what's the one thing when you just think of your time at Celtic that that you remember so fondly? Um. As I said earlier, Rangers game, definitely the, the biggest highlight as an individual game. But in general, trophies, you know, it's that I'm, something that I'm very proud of to to achieve, to win that many trophies in, in such a massive club. You know, it's, um, yeah, that's in general what football is about, you know, and then to manage to do it is another thing and and um yeah look back at my time at celtic was brilliant and I, i'm um, i'm very happy and very proud for for all all the things i, I managed to achieve there with the with the team yeah so many brilliant memories and brilliant to go back to them all stefan thank you so much for taking out the time to speak with us in the celtic view podcast and all the best with, with the rest of the season at, at queen's park rangers as well hope hope you thank can you. push for that playoff yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Thank you so much. It's always nice to hear from former players there still saying how much love he has for the football club and how he still looks out for all the fixtures. It's always great to hear that. Um, Paul, let's go on to the, the women's team now. Um, since we were last in here, they've had seven games, six wins and one draw. That draw being... An nil draw against uh, Motherwell. They've scored 37 goals in those seven games, advancing the cup as well. At the moment, they're currently sitting three points behind Glasgow City. They've got a better goal difference than the teams in first and third at the moment. And there's still games against both Rangers and Glasgow City to come. How do you assess the, the women's team since we were last in here? I mean, again, it's so tight at the top of the table. Mm -hmm. And... I think we, we benefited when I think Glasgow City and Rangers drew, so it allowed us to, to claw back some of the, the gap between between ourselves and Glasgow City. And I think those games are going to be key. However, I think the, that one draw against Motherwell, and, and I know, you know, from the game and then when you, you listen to the, the post-match post comments from the manager and the players, that, that was a really frustrating night for them because certainly that would have been two points that they... They, they dropped, they know they should have won the game. So, again, similar to, to the first team, they have to avoid against complacency, that even though they'll be expected to win the majority of their games. You know, some of the teams in, in the SWPL, Hearts, for example, have, have got a lot better. So games against them are a bit tighter. Even the game at the weekend against Aberdeen, it was 
I mean, a pretty scrappy first half. It was almost the last header of the, of the first half. Chloe Craig scored the opener and the second half they were better. So, you know, there's still tough games ahead, but those games that they're still to play against the, the other two. And I, th I think there is a split in the, the Women's League this season as well. So, again, that means that the fixtures towards the end of the season will all be tougher. But, you know, they don't lose many goals, you know, really solid defence and they're scoring a lot of goals. They've obviously lost Clarissa Larissey who scored a lot of goals, but, you know, the, the players that are coming in, um, whether it's, you know, players that they've brought in or, you know, some of the academy girls are stepping up as well. So there's a lot of positives, but, you know, obviously it's, it's so tight. We could, you know, that way you could finish first conceivably, which would be incredible. Or you could just miss out in those two Champions League places. So every every game is absolutely vital. Yeah, I mean we're sitting here at the moment. Um, the last couple of games it was three 0 against Aberdeen, uh, and two one against Hearts. They've got Spartans away next on Wednesday night as well. But in terms of the progression of the women's team, <clears throat> considering last year where they showed in any one off match they can beat anyone in in Scotland, having won both cups, which was such an am amazing achievement. <clears throat> But the consistency maybe wasn't there as much in the league. And speaking to people within the women's team at the start of the season and pre-season, the one thing they mentioned was we need to have that form we showed in the Cups and have it consistently throughout the season. And as much as I know that draw against Motherwell was really frustrating for them, being just three points behind, being in second place with those big games to come shows that that consistency has been there this season, which is a, which is a real positive for them. Yeah, and you can't, because it is so tight at the top, and the other teams don't drop many points either. So that, I think that was where the frustration with the Motherwell game came in, because it was a, a game that they should have won. But as I say, the, the game against Hearts was a good one. They were, we were the first team to beat Hearts at the O-Room uh, through in Edinburgh this season. So again, that shows how difficult they are. I think they're fourth at the moment. So, yeah, I mean, I think you can tell that the confidence is high, but they know, they know how tough it will be. But... As you say, on, on any, you're almost l not quite looking at those games as, as one-off cup games, but you know we can beat Glasgow City. We have, we can beat Rangers. We have, so there's no reason why we're certainly still in the hunt for for our first title. And in terms of individual players, since coming back from that winter break, last summer we lost Charlie Wellings, and people were looking at how we're going to replace those goals. And Clarissa Larrissey stepped up. Cla Clarissa Larrissey then leaves. In the winter, I'm saying who's going to step up and score the goals? And Amy Gallagher has probably been the one that, that stepped into that role. She scored nine goals in those seven games as well. Is there anyone else in the team that's really impressed you? Because for me, she's been the one that's, that's really has impressed me in going in there and, and getting the, the goals. Yeah, I mean, I think she's been a really good signing actually um, since she joined from Hibs. And I always think, you know, I'm sure she's probably not, she won't be sick of people saying she's uh, Patsy Gallagher's great great granddaughter, but I think that's what an impressive. Celtic pedigree. Um, I think I, I, I watched the game on Sunday and, um, and I think they're really benefiting having Natalie Ross back in midfield. I know her and Lisa Robertson wasn't playing at the weekend but their experience I think is absolutely vital because it's such a, a mix of, of youth and experience so I think it was uh, Claire Goldie came, made her first start as an academy girl that should come through the ranks which again I think is I think, always think it's really encouraging for the, the young players that are coming through you know, we've seen it with Tyree Burchill as well. Just players who have been playing with the academy, but they're getting that chance. They're training with the first team, and then they're, you know she set up Natalie Ross's goal. But Natalie Ross is such a an experienced player at the heart of the midfield as well. So I think it's good having her back. You know, she's had problems with injuries in the past, but you know that's a real positive for us. Yeah, let's hope that they can keep that form going and hopefully have some more medals to celebrate by the end of the season. Um, let's move on to the B team. Now, uh, they also had their own winter break in December. They came back with that 5-2 victory at Celtic Park in the Derby. Um, since then, so it's been nine games since they've returned. They've had five wins and two draws and they've been mixing between the Lowland League and the, the Premier League Invitational Cup as well. Um, they're currently sitting fourth in the Lowland League at this moment in time but they have played less games than the teams that are all ahead of them at the moment and they were sitting top only a few weeks ago. So again, same question, what have you made of the B team since they've returned? Well, I think that game here when they beat Rangers is obviously just in terms of confidence. 
because I think last season, you know, we played a, a derby game here and it didn't end so well, and that that would have that would have been a real downer for them. So I think just the fact that we won and won so convincingly, that's a great springboard. I think certainly towards before the break, I think we spoke about it. The fact that the the benefits of playing in that uh, UFA Youth League or playing at a higher standard and how they were translating that into their league form. As you say, at the top of the Lone League, it's so tight. Obviously, we can't get promoted. But at one point, you know, we've been top. Rangers have been top. There's been other teams have been top as well. And they've obviously got aspirations to go through the pyramid. So, you, you know, we're, we're certainly competing at a higher, higher level. And I think playing in that international cup, you know, we're playing the likes of Leicester and Blackburn. Again, it's a different environment. It's a different challenge. Just even part of that experience of having to travel down to England, playing these games against these top academy sides and competing really well, and I'm sure that's what, what Darren and Stephen are, are looking for. That experience then translates back to the Lowland League games when we're playing week in, week out in those games. So, as always, I think when you look at the Celtic team, it's such a young team. You know, there's there's players there that are, you know, could, I think could still play under 18s, but their the, the idea is obviously to push them through quicker and get that experience. So, it's been, I think it's been a really positive season so far for the team. And I think in terms of their own game improvements. I, for me personally, I've seen big changes from the start of the season to the way that they're they're playing now. And the games programme they've got, you mentioned the Youth League, the Premier League International Cup, the Lowland League, they're getting a real mix of playing the best at their age group around Europe and uh, in the UK and also playing that Lowland League where you know, people, people's lives on the line, where they're, they're having to earn money, they're trying to get promotions, they're trying to avoid relegations. It's a great games programme for them at the moment. In terms of that Premier League International Cup, um, since returning, they beat Wolves 4-2 away, drew two each with Leicester, which was which was gutting because that was a, a goal in injury time, and then lost to, to Blackburn. But they're going up against these teams who are playing against the best in England, and they're not even just matching them. And the game against Leicester, when I, I was at it, the first half, they played some brilliant, brilliant football as well. And, there just seems to be a really good progression about the team under Stephen and Darren. Yeah, and I, I think that was part of the idea of the, the restructuring and to get, and we've spoke about it before, to get the B team mirroring what the first team do because, you know, seeing it with Boston Law, for example, and Rocco uh, Vata, you know, both training with the first team but then also playing with the first team. But it's because what they're doing at B team level in terms of their training and then the way they're playing mirrors the first team. Obviously, it's a, it's a big step up. But the fact that they're, you know, players like that are actually training regularly with the first team helps them. And again, similar to, to what we're saying about, you know, some of the academy girls coming through and playing for the first team, that's a real encouragement for the, the younger girls in, in the academy. You know, when, you, when the B team see some of their teammates training with the first team, travelling with the first team and playing with the first team, that's, I mean, that's got to be an incentive because it shows that the manager is aware of what's happening in the B team. So there's that kind of connection now with, with the coaches across both sides. Because ultimately what the B team and what Darren and Stephen are doing is to, you know, produce players for the Celtic first team. That's that's the ultimate aim. And, I th you know, as a fan, and I think over the years, that's always been the case, the more homegrown players that y you can you can bring through, the better. Because you kind of, you do, you, I mean, you love all the players that play for Celtic, but there's something... You know, about the likes of Callum McGregor and James Forrest having come through the academy and, and making it into the first team and becoming the first team regulars. That's, a, that's always been part of, of the kind of the dynamic of Celtic, of, of producing their own players. Yeah, it's ingrained in the club, isn't it? We've, we've always had, it felt like we've always had someone in the starting 11 that have went through that journey. And the fact that you've got both of Stephen and Darren themselves that have also yeah. went through that journey, they're the best people to be in that position to guide these young players for this next step in their career and to try and get them into that first team as well. Um, and we, spoke, we heard the manager in, in recent weeks talking about the B team and some of the, the individual players. We've seen contract ex extensions for a lot of them. Matthew Anderson's, Bruno Davidson uh, signing his on, on Monday as well. So there seems to be some, some good excitement around the B team at this moment um, within the club and, and they're showing that on the pitch as well. Um, I wanted to ask as well about individual, we talked about in the women's team, about players that you maybe looked at and, and thought recently that performed well. 
My shout would be, again, because it's a striker and it's probably quite easy, but Joey Dawson, since coming back, has been amazing, scoring 10 goals. I think he went a run of three or four games, he scored two goals in each game as well. He's been he's been so, so impressive. It's, it, is he one that stands out for you, or is there anyone else? It's, it's yeah, I mean, obviously, Celtic fans will remember him playing against St Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Boxing Day last year? It was, yeah. When we were kind of decimated by injuries, so, and, and did, did well. Almost scored, so it was like, it had one clear off the line, which for me, I'd probably still be thinking about. <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, I, I, any time I've watched the B team, I, I, I really like Matthew Anderson, actually, you mentioned him there, and I think he's still the, the captain, yeah. you know, this season. Um, I, I think he looks really good on the ball, but I, I just, I think sometimes when you look at the younger players, it's just a kind of the demeanour, the, de the demeanour, the way they carry themselves on the pitch, the way they are, not only with the ball, without the ball. And I really like the way, as I say, when I've watched him playing, I like the way he seems to, just seems to be and conducts himself on the pitch. And, um, you know, I'm really glad that, you know, he's obviously extended his stay and getting a, you know, hopefully taking that next step that, again, he might be one of the ones that's in the next year or so wanting to push forward and be training more regularly with the first team and ultimately trying to get in the team. Yeah, the great thing about watching the B team this season is that if you watch the first team and you enjoy what you see there, you pretty much get a carbon copy with the B team because they try and play the exact same way, they play with the same energy and try and play with the same intensity as well. So it's just, you know, you get you get two batches of Celtic in one, so it's, it's brilliant. Um, and again, they've got uh, Sterling Uni away on Wednesday and Bonus away on Saturday in a long week as well. So hopefully a couple of victories there. Um, so to, <laughs> to end on, um, we usually always like end in a predictions game. Um, I'm going to tee this up for next week because we've not got a fan involved um, for this week's edition. What we usually do is that we'll go up against each other. We pick seven fixtures for the week ahead and we get you involved as the fans and each week we get someone else different to, to go up against us as well. So basically this is a call for action um, for the next couple of weeks to get some more fans. I was... I was, I was whether or not to bring the predictions games back because you're sitting top with 48 points, the fans have 41 and I'm in 38 and I've had no joy this season. You can't abandon a competition halfway through, <laughs> I know. through the season just because you're not going to win it. Exactly, the whole competition. Yeah. I'm a bit of a sore loser so I really was considering it all throughout January. Um, but yeah, next week we'll, we'll bring that back so I'll need to get some studying and see what the fixtures are, uh, are going to be looking ahead to next week. But... That's us for now, Paul. Uh, thanks very much for joining us and, and thank you very much for listening as well. Wherever you listen to this podcast, whether it's on YouTube and Spotify, Apple Podcasts or on Google, it's on all platforms, so make sure you listen to it there. And make sure you subscribe to the Celtic View channel on all of those channels and please like and subscribe and we'll see you again next week. Thanks for now.